I grew up all day because they switched to December right from our planet, and I just can't eat all the December Christmas. So I told them how we're going to go. And then, uh, let's see, on the 28th, we're doing these other reprobates, uh, Cherry Priest and Lord. Oh, okay. That's so pretty good. Anyway, I'm just going to go across the road, and then they're going to read and do Q&A, and we'll basically get some questions and terrorize them. Uh, I'm right, right. There are several novels, on crafting levels, uh, psychic face, and anyway, novels. I'm just going to go to his range. Yeah. But he has the new, what does it, Revelator? Revelator was out, yeah. The newest day, when you're here. New West, yeah. New paperback coming out in February, though. Long delayed paperback. Yeah. Nancy Cress's newest book is Observer, which she covered in person about how that worked out. And we could sit there for a second, that's just what's happening in Google is and was that would just force that. But I can say that she was one of the first authors that I recognized, understood the concept of we play with science fiction, we should deal with consequences. Like the average science fiction of my youth was, hey, we got a rock ship, we'll go to Mars. Nothing about how it's destroyed our economy or we're going to fight to immigrate or Nancy Cress things. The sleep does what she considers the repercussions of what's going on. I always thought that was the best part. It's also fun to watch her terror. She's a great teacher. I'm impressed with the business. And then there's Jen Scully said, What's the newest book here from Fairway Press? I mean, I forgot the little bit. Old Mess, right? Sorry. Good bunch of short stories. Not since Jack Katie will get some. It was like a Jack short story. Jack is my favorite. Yeah, we're just read. Uh, I'm gonna read a short selection. I'm gonna read Texas piece, and then Jack's gonna read one of the collections. And uh, we will answer any questions. Do what I call you. I call readings ego correction exercises. So if you're feeling really good by yourself, like I would, then I would go these by myself. Uh, then there would be like two people, and it would be me and the bookseller. And then, uh, so thank you so much for showing up. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd read from um, uh, a short story um, that I'm working on right now. It's actually not finished. It's close to being finished. So that's why I'm reading from the beginning of the story. Uh, I, 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 uh, I said something rash on Twitter. Do you remember Twitter? Yeah, it's gone now. But um, I said something like, um, I, you know, I love King Bang so much, uh, and I could never write a space opera. But if I did, it would be a, it would be something stupid like two guys would have to move a couch during a, during an alien invasion. That would be the that would be the story. And then Jonathan Schron wrote back and said, I will buy that. <laughs> and so this is that story. <laughs> um, and he hasn't technically bought it yet, so we're just trying this out right now. He may read what he actually asked for and, and be appalled by it. So uh, this is called I'm Not Disappointed, Just Mad, aka, AKA The Happiest Couch in the Known Universe. Okay, let's skip the prologue for now and get right to the invasion and where it started for Tyndall with the tragedy of the Tim Hortons cookie. Uh, Tyndall was sitting on the floor of his dark, cozy bedroom, jamming to Paul Langa's swinging cover of Wonderwall. By the way, this exists. It's appalling. Read, listen to Paul Langa's cover of Wonderwall. Uh, and about to tuck into his breakfast, a sexy red velvet cookie with cream cheese filling, only slightly crusty from spending the night lost in his bed linens, when the bedroom door was yanked open. Unfortunately, he was leaning against the door at the time. He fell into the sunlit living room, and the cookie, seizing its moment to escape, flew from his hand, bounced once, and vanished into, into the general chaos of the apartment. He would never see that cookie again. A wail escaped him, then he squinted upwards at the imperious figure looming over him, the being that had so rudely hoiked open his door. He tilted his head, hoiked his the real word, by the way. Look, there's only five people here. He tilted his head to take in the perimeter of the silhouette. 
It had been a couple years since he'd seen her. She looked the same, the Nordic pop star cheekbones, the black hair streaked with gray, those eyes that could grab you and then just suddenly let you go like a firefly. He scrambled to his feet. How did you find me? Well, uh, no, that came out wrong. He put his guilty feelings aside for a moment and hugged her. I mean, what are you doing here? She returned the hug and then leaned down, lovingly cradled his face in her hands and plucked the earbuds from his ears. You're shouting, she said. Do you know what's going on outside? He, he's wanted to say yes, but now, now that they thought about it, there had been more than the usual amount of brouhaha in the apartment, and a continuous warbling of sirens in the distance, and the roar of large, roaring things. Uh, the floors and walls had been vibrating intermittently as if the building had been rezoned as a subwoofer. He had been nearly tempted to turn off his earbuds. Uh, I've been in my room all morning. Uh, that's not a room, you know. That's a coat closet. Well, former coat closet. Now it's she, she raised an eyebrow. My closet. I've been trying to call you for an hour. She looked around at the array of couches and cots, the assortment of battered furniture and cockeyed lamps, the power strips that sprout with cables, snowmen-esque piles of garbage bags filled with clothes, and the many, many candles, most of which were unlit. Oh, my dear. I should have set eyes on you in person well before this. How many people live here? On average? What was odd was that none of the dozen or so roommates, no order hangers on, couch surfers, and auxiliary sex partners, were present. Where is everybody? They probably evacuated, she said, or found a shelter. Oh, my goodness, were being evicted? Thunder rattled the windows. A blown glass bomb tumbled off a shelf onto another bomb and both shattered. Sirens wailed in the distance. Time to move, she said. Also, you're going to need pants. <laughs> he was wearing only his tidy, not so whiteies, in stark contrast to his men, who looked, per usual, ineffably cool, even though each article of clothing could have been grabbed from a good glow rack. Today's look might be called Parisian lumberjack, gone clam digging. Flannel shirt tight at the waist, dungarees rolled to her shins, ballet flats, and a chunky necklace. Tyndall scrabbled around his 1.3 meter bedroom, finding and wriggling into clothes. So, where are we going exactly? My house, I need your muscle. Ha! Well, okay, your energy and Morris's muscle. Morris, nobody except Miss Mary called El Capitan by his third name. I've already called him and he's waiting, I'm waiting for him, she said. I thought you two were living together. Oh, we were, but Al Cap's got a poly thing going right now. I was kind of like, not a third wheel exactly, fifth or maybe sixth. Um, so anyway, I got my new place here. What is this muscular activity? You two are going to move a couch across town. He poked his head out the door. A couch? Not Mr. Nappy. Prince, <laughs> she said. He said, you can't sell him, I'll take him. I'm afraid you don't have a room to know. True, but maybe you can find a new room. He loved that couch. I mean, growing up, he spent many afternoons and not a few nights stretched out on his comfortable. Mr. Nappy is moving to a new home upstate, this man said. Extremely upstate. Well, at least you're not throwing him out. He tied up his hair and emerged, more or less decent. Miss Maddie stood by the door impatient, but Tyndall looked around worriedly, feeling as if he were leaving something behind. Oh, the candles. He danced around the room, blowing them out. Yeah. Can't be too careful, he explained. Some of his roommates owned only enough belongings to carry, and one more apartment fire in the room. You're sweet, Miss Maddie said, but you need you to go. He followed her down the three flights of stairs to the front steps of the building. The sirens were louder, and a line of cars jammed the street. She set up down the sidewalk in a swift march toward El Capitan's apartment. A pair of military jets raked the rooftops and zoomed out of sight. Though it was embarrassing, he decided that he simply had to ask, uh, What's going on exactly? Behind you, Miss Maddie said. He looked back, then up, hovering above the Toronto skyline a few miles away, a gargantuan shape swallowed half the sky. The lumpy gray slab bristled with long needles and the scores of giant porcupines had become stuck in cement. The two military jets seemed to be headed straight at it. At the last moment, they peeled off in opposite directions. 
Is that a spaceship to the left? Indeed. A column of light appeared below the ship, glittering like crushed disco balls. The light enveloped the skyscraper as if highlighting how lovely it was. Were the aliens scanning it, getting ready to levitate it up into their ship? Then the building exploded. Okay, so, um, oh, the boom arrived, oh, that's right, there's two more sentences. The boom arrived a long moment later, as if surprised by this turn of events, that it nearly missed its cue. Oh, my stars and garbage, the He scrambled to catch up to Miss Patty. Uh, are you sure you want to move a couch during the alien invasion? Uh, it's, it's one spaceship. That's hardly an invasion. Um, okay, so uh, that's the opening scene. Uh, I'm doing one more short session. Don't get too excited yet. Um, of course, the couch is not a couch. Miss Maddie is not Miss Maddie, uh, not a normal human. And her robot vacuum cleaner, uh, Mr. Sucky, uh, is uh, he's a robot, but he's not exactly a vacuum cleaner. Um, and then um, we do get the we do get to the prologue that I skipped eventually. Um, we, we do that later in the story. And three quarters of the way through the story, uh, we get this epilogue. We'll see if Jonathan Strong actually likes to do anything. Avalon. I'm so sorry, Tyndall. I, why am I putting you through this? Why am I telling you this story? On the bookcase next to my writing desk is a shelf filled entirely with the works of Ian Banks and Ian M. Banks, one man with two names. I've read every book he's written except one. He died in 2013. I never got to meet him. If I had, I, I would have embarrassed myself. I would have tried to tell him how much his books meant to me. How in common, a friend who I who knew I wanted to be a writer handed me Begg's first novel, The Lost Factor, and said, I think you're going to write this. And I did too. I mean, it lit me up. I couldn't believe how daring and strange it was. And then a few years later, I read Consider Phlebas, the first of his space operas about a society called the culture. It was just, so what do you think? All the musty uh, space umpires from Heinlein and Clark and Asimov that I observed over years and then spun them into jazz. I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know how to write like that, and I didn't know how to get learned to do things. Uh, this is the story where we get to a footnote. One of Banks' early influences was the, was the novel Lenar uh, by his fellow Scott Alistair. Ray placed the epilogue in the novel uh, four chapters from the end. Uh, and in it, the author of Lunar, calling himself uh, Nastor, directly addresses the main character, telling him that the epilogue is placed where it is because uh, it's important to go the end. Uh, it's too important to go at the end. It lets me utter some fine sentiments which I could hardly trust to a mere character. So Ray also placed in the epilogue an index of plagiarisms a list of influences and outright literary thefts he used to write his book, Lenard, uh, which reminds me, uh, all information about Banks and Lenard, I looked at from the Culture Series of Ian and Banks, uh, a critical introduction by Simon Murray. Um, end of <laughs> His books don't exist in your world, in your world, Tyndall, so a few details. Uh, the culture novels are science fiction, Set in a post scarcity communist utopia spread thinly over the galaxy and kept working by powerful AIs called Mimes for the benefit of its human and machine citizens. Uh, maybe that kind of thing sounds familiar to you now. The bloom, neotons, and gads, like these are all words that are in the story earlier. These are words that you know now that are similar to ones in the culture novels, and I had to change them for both artistic and if Banks were alive, I wouldn't have written the story. I would have happily waited for his stories, especially the true ones. Sometimes I think, I mean, wouldn't it be great to sit around and have a whiskey with Banks and just let him tell the story about the night he crashed his porch? Or the one about him climbing up uh, the wall outside the hotel of the Brighton Road Club. Um, I've heard some of these tales from his friends, but I would have loved to have heard them from the man himself. Um, as I write this, it's been almost exactly 10 years since he died in Galway, and the arbitrariness of that pisses me off. 
I mean, all those sports cars you drove fast around the switchbacks of Scotland, and the universe couldn't see fit to let them die in a fiery crash at the age of, say, 98. He was robbed of a suitable death. And decades ago, he was robbed of the many books he wrote to write. Uh, the one existing novel of his that I haven't read is It's the last one you It's sitting right there a few feet from the last I may not be able to live in a utopia, but I can make sure that I live in a world that is one more than a book waiting for me. I'm sorry, Tim. Was this too sentimental? I mean, this story was supposed to be a bit of fun to pay an homage to my favorite writer. Um, but here's this movie head yeah, on. So it's a third time reading this. Um, Here's this mopey uplog jammed into the middle of the text, and the story got darker than I intended. All that violence of sadness that's coming out. My apologies. I just want you to know that if I could, I would not only the Gatsics do what they did to this man. So that's, a, so that's the epilogue, and then there's more story to come, where I swear it does get lighter. Um, well, so there's all this dark violence, and then at the very end, I bring it back around, hopefully, and we'll see if uh, John is trying to do it. Yeah, <laughs> we have to see if the couch gets moved, where it gets moved to, and uh, yeah, let's get back to Yeah, so, yeah, oh yeah. Because I don't know what's happening with Twitter Com anymore because um, their editor, they're in charge, their editor in chief, uh, left that week out. And they don't actually know who's doing final version. Um, so we'll see. There's a tour of this thing where there's a choir editor to buy stories. And then usually the editor in chief says, oh, okay, this is good to go. So I have no idea what it is. Oh, that's they're still posting stories. They're still, they're still paying. Stuff. Yeah, and they're still, I mean, their story scheduled, and they're not stopping along. So, um, so it's a Okay. Well, I'm feeling very old and all of this time because my prologue is at the beginning. I know, I know. Now I just post on a date. This is the prologue of so my book that came out in January last year. And my first collaborative novel, and it will be my last. <laughs> I discovered from doing this that I am not a team player. I'm on only my fingerprints. Um, my collaborator, Dr. Robert Bonson, is not a writer, he's a scientist. In fact, he's a very eminent scientist. He, in 2014, time named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, he is a geneticist who's responsible for all the original stem cell research and also for bringing back an extinct animal, the guar. G U A R or G A U R. I don't know what that is or why we needed one, but you know that. As always, whenever I've worked with other people, usually students, when I used to teach in DC, and in any writing class, Lawyers. None of them wanted to write about the problem. They all wanted to write else in the um, he did, Robert Lanza didn't want to write physics. He wanted to write physics and a theory of consciousness in the universe called Biocenters, for which he had already published three nonfiction books that he wanted to write to an audience. So he decided that he would find a writer um, and, uh, and uh, we did this one time. I'm only going to read the prologue. And I'm sorry if it's not funny. <laughs> no one wanted to tell the old man. They clustered in the courtyard outside his bedroom, under the wide overhang that sheltered the law. The residential wing, one of three, had been built in a square around the central courtyard at the western end of the compound to get the slanting rays of morning sun. This early, barely after dawn, the air was still fresh and cool. Clean, salty singer of the breeze off the curtain. Nonetheless, the three people could hear the AC going full blast behind the old man's door. James had a household staff, 
putting slippers in a flamboyant silk robe that were not even out of place in 1940s Hollywood, had been among those alerted by the night duty tent as soon as the police arrived. Julian had gone to the police to identify the body. Two of Julian's security techs, sent to inform the old man of what had happened, looked expectantly at James. He tightened the belt of his robe and said, I don't see why I have to wake him up. There's nothing for Dr. Watkins to do. He's old and very ill. Let him sleep. The techs didn't answer, but their glances at each other spoke terrible. Only someone not directly involved in the project would think that Dr. Watkins wouldn't want to know instantly what happened. But it was James who had the inspiration. I know. Wake Dr. Wybert. Wybert did not be called away because Julian had left strict instructions that Wybert was never ever to talk to either of these. The two young techs suspected the reason was Wybert sometimes indiscreet things. They did not say this aloud. Now the police had come. The text nodded, and James phoned him. He, too, arrived in slippers and robes, although his was a faded terry cloth that looked older than all three young men were today. James explained in great detail what their Lisa told him. Ryder nodded slowly and knocked on the bedroom door. What the? Oh, it's you, George. What is it? Ryder entered the bedroom, as small and whitewashed as all the others set around the courtroom, although even more big. Neither luxury nor home decoration interested the actors. He never put personal bits and pieces on the walls or on the dresser. Wybert discovered that it had been a piece that he heard through the but a very noisy space like that. The room was a sign. Is that necessary for Sam's condition? Wybert, the physicist by the other position, had no idea. Sam, there's been an accident. As Samuel Lewis Watkins, genius Nobel lawyer, switched on the bedside lamp and moved his left right for him. Cheekbones, chisels, all head shining and all What kind of accident? Are the data and equipment safe? Yes, they are. It's a diving accident to David Reeves. He's dead. Julian just left with the police to identify the body, but apparently there's no doubt it's Dr. Reeves. Why there? I know Sam since the university days, and he just liked confrontation, braced himself for a tsunami of expertise. Sam had told Reeves to stop dying. No, not told. Or The tsunami of expletives didn't come. Instead, Watkins got the intense, focused look that meant his remarkable brain is processing multiple ideas, imagining, synthesizing, evaluating. That brain had got them all here and was remote by the comment on the fire, the white one was certainly never expected. What about the instant was talent? Weeks must have gone out last night. Julian hasn't had time yet to check the surveillance wall. The police said that Dr. Weeks' body was discovered this morning. Stay near the top of the floor of the device of the issue. He dropped his weight belt and his buoyancy device was partially inflated, which is why the body rose. His skins had the address of the compound painted on them. The police said there was no sign of any violence or sharks or humans or anything like that. And probably Luke had a heart attack or something and tried to get out of the water and he died first. Watkins and I, damn idiot, I told him not to. He looked to me at the white wash of water. Yes, White, he said. Is that what she's there to say? Warm the mud and rough the cold away from the water. The sun had topped and he would be there. Watkins was silent for a long time. Why could you not help him as a big old space of stairs and personal memories of daily abuse brought into the project on your account? Or of the project itself, now short of crucial memory, we've lost the jeopardized ability. It had not been easy to find a nerve surgeon willing to perform the unusual operations of the project. When the silence stretched on and on, and then on some more, Ryder could stand up. Sam, should I? You don't have to do anything. And then, George, I'm running out of time. Ryder, started by the reference to where everyone knew that no one ever mentioned in Sam's presence. I didn't know what to say. He said, I know. Of course, you do. I'm sure everybody knows. Right down to James's kitchen. All right, send for Hattie. 
a lawyer. Bill Haggerty, another old friend of Watkins, was the only one connected with the compound who not only lived off site but off island. All communication with him was through heavily encrypted email. Yes, yes, why well, tell him to come today. But today, today, and then with a grimace on that disease rash face, our project is too important to the future not to have thought of all the actualities. I have a plan. Whole book is plan B. And it involves another neurosurgeon, who also, like why they're very respectful of the media guard in this particular project, in this particular purpose, and what the project is, and what its complications are, and uh, what it ultimately means before I went to the limits of unconsciousness of the integration, I just want to be there. I want to apologize for the background noise. It's a little more than we were planning on. You didn't know what to expect. Sorry. We're going to take questions after the panel. I'm not funny either. I'm going to stand up so I can project to the back. <laughs> um, I'm going to read two very short things. First, a very short opening to a very long story. And then just the whole theme for my famous essay. This story is called Stricolia. It was taken from the Polish word Stricolia, meaning roughly lost thing, something lost. And it's essentially about the news that unravels and then moves off into the field. Frank woke at 2 o'clock in the morning and discovered his wife was missing. It took a moment for the situation to register. He sat up and rubbed his face, clipped on the bedside lamp. The condo was quiet. He got out of bed and pulled on his pajama bottoms. At the top of the stairs, he paused. Janet? She didn't answer. He went down, switched on lights, searched the condo. Finally, he opened the door to the garage. The car was gone. An oil stain on the snow looked like cold blood. Back upstairs, he found his cell phone and called Jan's number. Her phone started vibrating on the bedside table. Frank put on pink toys and a sweatshirt. He considered calling the police, but what would he tell them? Janet was 46 years old. If she wanted to take a drive in the middle of the night, that was her life. Frank paced around, trying to imagine the reason she would go out. There wasn't one. He sat on the sofa, both cell phones positioned on the coffee table, in case she called using someone else's phone. The coffee table was Really, an old steamer from Queen Jane the Bottle, an antique store, the first year of her marriage. Now it sat next to the sofa, like an awkward memory pattern as they had to step around the every day. Despite his anxiety, a strange lethargy stole over Frank. He tried to fight it off, but couldn't. Then he was waking up to the sound of the door closing. He looked at the ceiling. Directly above him was the bedroom. The floor creaked. Somebody was up there. He opened the bedroom door. All light fell across the bed. His wife appeared to sleep. What's going on? He said. She didn't reply. He approached the bed, placed his hand on her shoulder, and shook his hand. She moaned. Jan, come on. She awoke suddenly, looking disoriented. What? What? What's wrong? You tell me. She squinted at the clock. It's almost four in the morning. I know what time it is. Where did you go? Yes, where did you go? Come on, I woke up and you were gone. So was the car. No, you were gone. I freaked out. I was sleeping. You were going to go. No, I was dressed. Yeah, because I was worried about you. She stared at him and I was I haven't been in this bed. I think you've been sleeping. I haven't done that since I was sleeping. I'm going to have to sleep. She rolled on her side, muttered something, and then was out like a cloak. He went downstairs to turn off lights. Maybe he had this there. When he was 12, after the police and all the trouble, after his mother died, he had walked in his sleep. He always woke in the bathroom and drew a walk, as if to keep something out. But that had been pretty good. Frank thought of something. In the garage, bringing the needle on the He put his hand on the hood. The metal was warm. So, 
understand the light. Frank turned off the light. He opened the front door and stepped out. The night was crisp and the sky was clear. It hadn't rained in five days. Frank was a dispatcher at Boeing 737 Factory. He worked swing shift, and after 6 p.m., he was alone in the office bed. He complained about his job, no worry about it, but it suited Frank alone in his arms and Dan at home. They were distant, they were bound to each other, like entangled particles. Frank had drifted into the bone shop because he had drifted into his marriage. But now he needed both. Everything balanced. From below the high wire to the dark. He returned home at 11 p.m. Janet was already asleep. He stood next to the bed, glad she was there, but also glad she wasn't making his tight hand walk. Her face was tense, as if she were waiting for something. A noise, maybe, something sharp, real around her back. He got into bed. He said to the back of her neck, barely mouthing the words. It was something she used to say to him regularly. Do you love me? He began as a playful question. Later, she seemed to mean it, as if there could be any doubt, as if he hadn't married her in the first place. Janet And after a while, he rolled over, tingled in the sheets, something grabbing at him in sleep, some worry or fear. He blinked. Janet emerged from the bathroom. It was past 4 a.m. She had a tall team, pulled the covers aside, and lowered herself into bed. Janet, she began snoring. He touched her shoulders. Her snoring paused and resumed. He stood against her body, but her rigidity did not move. Her hair smelled faintly of fried food, the kitchen smell, a greasy spoon. He pressed close to her, close enough the tiny droplets of rain trapped in her hair. Touched his The following night, he took a note, he took note of the numbers along, writing the numbers on a scrap of paper. Instead of going to bed, he made a pot of coffee, determined to stay awake. He could feel Jan leaving now. He was scared. Sleep overcame him like a drug. He fought but couldn't keep his eyes open. He woke to the toilet flushing upstairs. Groggy, he stumbled to the garage and compared to the garage. The discrepancy was seven months. The next night, he ran into the front space in the back seat of the home. The strange fatigue came on swiftly, folded him under. Later, a sharp pain in his back woke him. Rain thundered on the roof. He struggled onto the sea. Orange street lamps glowed like lost suns down the long canyon of high rises. Across from the Honda, a diner with big windows stood open for business. Red neon spelled Charlie's. Frank pushed out of the car and ran across the street. The diner smelled of fried food and strong coffee. A couple of guys wearing shapeless caps sat at the counter staring at coffee cups. The nearer guy had a black mustache. Me. The waitress was Janet. She barely glanced at it. Janet, what's going on? She was changing out the coffee field for the machine. She looked over her shoulder. Yeah, I know you then. Work here? Sure, what's it look like? I don't understand. Why didn't you tell me? Why would I tell you anything? Both men seated at the counter turned toward Frank. Frank rubbed his forehead. I don't know, because we're married? You better hold your horses, Mr. Janet said. Coffee? What? Yes or no? Yes, whatever. Frank took a stool next to the mustache guy. Jan placed a thick white mug on a saucer and slopped coffee into it. Take cream? No way. She rolled her eyes. Anything else? Can we talk? This is crazy. She regarded him in a slow, evaluating way that was both familiar and, in this place, utterly formal. His tight rope had snapped. It was falling. Okay, Jan said. Just coffee then. She scribbled out a check and slapped it on the counter. Whenever you're ready. Jan, please. He reached for her wrist and she pulled it away. Mr. I don't know you. The guy with the mustache pulled a Frank's shoulder. Why not lay off, buddy? Why not mind your own business, Frank said. The man's grizzled, man's grizzled face appeared at the kitchen past him. Everything okay out there? Janice said, everything's fine, Charlie. I don't believe this shit, Frank said. Language, mustache guy said. The man next to him nodded and mumbled. Language. Frank said to Janet, at least tell me when you get off. 
I don't even go there, she said. Frank drank so much coffee, he had to use the bathroom. When he came back to the counter, Janet was gone. A different waitress asked, you want anything else? Where's my wife? Huh? Janet. Janet. Frank ran for the door. The Honda pulled away. He sprinted after it, waving. Jan looked at him, and he saw how clearly that she recognized him. The Honda accelerated, leaving Frank standing in the rain. Hey, you, somebody said. Frank spun around, mad at him to fight. It was Charlie from the diner. He didn't pay. Oh, for Frank produced his wallet and ripped out the bill. That covered? Where am I, anyway? How do I? Charlie squinted at the bill. You trying to be funny? The cup of coffee is more than five bucks. You've got to be kidding me. This ain't money. Charlie snapped the bill and took Frank by the arm and started dragging him back to the diner. Hey, Frank tried to wrench away. His temper boiled over and he swung at the cook's jaw. The angle was wrong. The punch landed without authority. You doing that, Charlie said. It authorizes me to defend myself. You goddamn asshole, Frank said. The cook whipped him around and drove his knuckles into Frank's face. The lights went out. We have to read on, find out what happened. Um, this little bit is from a, what I'm calling my famous essay to the nation. <laughs> um, it's called the right, excuse me, the writing life, and it's um, essentially for this collection. I wanted to add some new material, so I thought I'd write an essay about how I started trying to get published and where I wound up at the end of it. How long it took. It seemed to take me an importantly long time. So I thought it might be interesting for you know, younger writers. I'm still on the field of this. And uh, I quickly discovered that I was misremembering my own history. And I had it completely wrong. It just didn't feel right. So I went back and did that. The, the essence of this essay is sort of a detective investigation to figure out who that guy was and how did he actually get it. So this is called The Writing Life. It just opens like this. I've been publishing professionally for 21 years. Now here's the other part. I strive an equal number of years just to arrive at that starting point. My story was always about getting to the future, where I imagined I already existed as a published writer. Eventually that story came true, but there's another kind of self-story that we tell ourselves, and that is about the past, about who we used to be. The first draft of this essay acknowledged the guess I'd written a lot of words over a long period of time, prior to breaking into print. I told myself the reason it took so long was a combination of my disorganization and my dread of rejection. That dread exacerbated by emotional trauma suffering in adolescence. Essentially, I was spinning the victim there. I wasn't lying, but I am a good liar. But just as in fiction, memory and imagination were the primary ingredients of the past. Even the victim's children must have seemed preferable to what they actually down and leave the reality of it. Failure upon embarrassment, failure followed by a lucky break, revitalized by a vision of the The victim's children. The lucky break story were both false narratives. The truth was in a box, several boxes actually, waiting to go. Something about that first version of the essay wasn't adding up. It felt like I was writing about someone else. Maybe one of the characters from as my wife likes to put it, my tortured lonely guy stories. I decided to excavate my old manuscripts, notebooks, and injections out of the closet. I was looking to reconstruct a timeline to see where my memory may have gone off track. Luckily, I had the foresight to put dates on the novels, and many of the rejection letters and correspondence with bad applications were also there. But I soon discovered that I was doing more than establishing a timeline. I was discovering the true picture of who I had been. The person who emerged wasn't the guy I'd been selling to myself and others. My wife came into the kitchen that first day of excavation and found me sorting through piles and piles of rejection letters. What are you doing? she asked. I told her I was trying to find the guy I used to be so I could understand how I became who I am or something. She laughed. It was kind of, it is kind of funny when you think about it. For the next week or so, it was our little joke. I'd be shut up in my office, floor desk covered with little manuscripts, bent 
show for known books that filled with my legend and sprawled decades ago. How's it going? She called me down the hall. Find him yet? Kidding. And it goes on. Now, this is the time for questions. Any questions you have uh, about what we read or what we didn't read or process or uh, Daryl's fascination with cultures. Anything that happens to come to mind? Torture Bowman got on. And then you open with a torture Bowman got on. Yeah, that's the problem. In fact, I'm actively trying to write non torture lonely guy stories. I succeeded a few times in this collection. But I was working on a story for about five weeks ago. And I started out with one idea of this character being kind of honest. But it turns out I push I fight against that and push against it. But I, I think all writers have there's you get into a position where this is what I write about, this is what I mean. that's not right. I wind up doing that unless you can really break out of the conscious So I think it's possible to break out of the conscious So is there. I didn't really think I had any recurring days until somebody asked me at a convention, um, how come there's so many pairs of sisters in your stories? And then I realized that I'm a father and I have a sister. And um, we have a loving but very complicated I mean, and they're always kind of the same thing, and then you're trying to find new angles on it. I'm like, so how many more novels you got in like, I don't know. Like, like he, he was terrified of repeating stuff as he thought about the you start your career with a bunch of childhood things that you're doing, and you think, okay, so this, is, this stuff keeps you in your and then you're wondering, well, how many times do you have to do that? So, I mean, the same stuff for me always keeps coming up. There's family stuff, there's religious stuff, there's stuff about feeling sort of outside of your body, and then you can kind of come But one thing I discovered late was, um, like, oh, the, the story only turns on for me when I figure out what the part of it is and basically giving empathy to everybody in the story. Like, I realized I was writing better when every single person I could have empathy for was in the theory of cards with other characters. And I was writing almost falsely when it was, I was just trying to engineer from antagonists and protagonists. And Began to feel fake until, like, the story of tonight was like, it started out really as a bar, but it's a joke story. And I was like, well, where's the artist? Why do you even want to do this? And then it turned into an epilogue about the next I'm like, oh, this guy, what he did with his son. Oh, so that's the art of the story. So that was going to be the secret part of the story. And I thought, well, it's a short story, it's not a novel, it can be more experimental. So why not put the heart of the story, like just be as naked as possible on the page and see if that works. So you were the one working with the victims of this experiment. Yeah, I would build on that. I can't write unless I become a protagonist. I don't think I could be very in the story because I have cast of thousands of books, including that But I have to become that character. And I was on a panel once on the writer's block, um, or getting stuck, or the imposter syndrome, because those things were all kind of difficult to write. It was not a very successful panel. It was at a convention center in which one of the panels knew yes. how to do the imposter syndrome. Well, she said, present. And I said, this is my this is, this is a an error of thinking. I can be corrected by thinking about the thinking. But I, I was saying that for me as most writers, the best part of writing is to get into that flow state where the room disappears, 
uh, you disappear. You're not there because you are your character. And when somebody comes in and disturbs you, you have that jolt. And you look around and it's a second before you reorient. You can have that reading as well. I've often had that reading when somebody comes in. But you're not there. You're, you are that character. And most writers consider that flow state part of the form of the really best part. So, yeah. I have to be part of that character and immerse myself in her with him, often her with no others, and be that person. And then I just you know, I suppose it's a little different. Yeah. I mean, for me, a lot of times the flow state is in the sense it's like just trying to, uh, but it can be a little bored with the most normal way of saying it and then trying to make it better. And then you discover something about the character sometimes in two or seconds. Like, oh, this person talks like that. Um, and it's out of sometimes just sheer boredom. Of trying to keep yourself awake in front of all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll be typing it, I'm like, well, that's a boring way of saying it. And then it's like, okay, so how can I make this whole paragraph work better and make the sentence better? Right? And, like, and then suddenly they keep the word turn the phrase, and I'm like, ah, that's this person. I'm going to try to try to frustrate the subject, stay in the but you don't read the bed read like this. All my first drafts are like, you don't like Well, you're reading later drafts. So the, the first draft is like the, the, the most, you know, the, the, the prosaic way of saying it. And then it's like, well, that's good. So. What's the best draft for you? Oh, my God. Culture. Culture. Those are those of you who have better styles than I am because you spend more time in your styles. But that's because, in my case, at least, I don't feel like I have much of a choice. And that's why I'm so much harder for me to do an author because I have to do a lot of planning and thinking novels. Method of writing. Kind of a vague idea of what I want to make a strong image and start writing, sort of narrating, and discovering what is working by the way I'm describing or talking about. So, yeah, that yeah. yeah. was for short stories. You write a 5,000 word story and rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, and you're still like in one way to send it. This is why I love Stricconia. The opening of that story, I've read that story three times and listening to it again. The thing, the thing that's great about it is how disorienting it is. Because, so, the way I would work that story, I would sort of like be thinking about like, how, does, how does moving between the worlds work? And the way it works in that story, it's so dreamlike. Like, he can, like, her, his wife's moving in and out of his own world. He's totally disconnected. He doesn't know what's going on. And then the, the sheer confusion of the reader, like, you're not sure where to put your feet. You know, and so, I, I, I just think it, it's great because the, the sliding in between is, is, it has dream logic. It doesn't have like, oh, this is where the portal is. Uh, I love that stuff. And I love the whole thing is too. I do think an effort to, I mean, in a story like this, it's not science fiction. But in this collection, there are some science fiction stories. In fact, the, the last story in the book, um, Tribute, is as hard SF as I've ever written. I actually researched it. I figured out you know, spaceships and little stuff and Mars and the whole thing. And I'm really proud of that story. So there's science fiction, but it's not what I usually do. I write hard SF, which means I'm constrained a great deal. I didn't start that way. I started out writing fantasy back in the early trials. And then as I moved forward, more and more science fiction, and harder science fiction, and not really hard science fiction. Um, I don't mean difficult, although I suppose I could be accused of that. But I mean hard in that it stays with known scientists in detail, known science in detail, up right up until the point where you do have to depart from the known science at some point, or you 
I mean, part of the science fiction, which is part of the fiction. But when I do do crime, I want it to be something that is within the realm of the possibility of known science. There are exceptions. I wrote a space opera in the United States from Maine, it came out a few years ago. And that's um, that's an interstellar spaceship zipping around and things like that. And I'm using the basic tropes of space opera there to say something else. But usually, I tend to stick to hard science off and genetic engineering. In this book, more on physics. But it's a different kind of way of approaching craft because you are constrained by the science. So what are you working on now? I just finished a novella. Um, this was an experiment I did. Ten years ago, I wrote a book that did not sell. And I um, like Jack, I'm more of a natural short story writer than a novelist. All of my awards have been for short fiction, up through the novella, um, except the novel. And the novel came hard to me because I'm not a careful outline player. So 10 years ago, I wrote this novel. Nobody got it all. I put it away. Last year, I reread it, and I thought, well, they were right not to write it. <laughs> it doesn't really work. And it, um, it doesn't. They take tension, it does build. And one of the many of the editors said, You've got two storylines going, you like this, you can give them to the But I, it, I, the science began to start with me. So I've spent the last couple of months tearing down and rebuilding that novel into the world. And um, it's out right now in the first place I've sent to the rest of the actors because I haven't finished it. You took one storyline to work in Hamlet. Yes, and the second one is there as well with entirely different characters and people, and the whole thing is much more concise. And I know more about maintaining tension than I do to So, we'll see how it happens. Wait, you have a story coming out? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, I have a story coming out from Troy.com um, called The Alice Well. Online? Online. And I must have. But I know it's okay. I haven't seen them. I don't like them. Just so. If anybody sees them, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's called yeah. the Alice Rowe. And that is science fiction, although it certainly doesn't look like it. But it does uh, turn, make a turn in the camera. It's impressive to hear that you've done the flyer. The flyer. What happens is, I don't get an image like Jack does, or a full of senses as much as Jack. But I get a character in a situation. Uh, Betters in Spain started with an idea um, that I had this couple that were, you know, found out that the genetic engineer had to make a, a child sleep in utero. Um, if I were writing that book, I could say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I knew a lot more about sleep and science. Probably my approach is different. But anyway, at that point, and I wrote the first couple of scenes in red hot heat as I always do. And then I stop and think, okay, now what? That kind of works for short stories. At least it always has for you. You feel your way through a scene by scene. It doesn't work as bad for novels. And I think that's why my novels are very, very successful. The novel version of the version is what I was And I started to talk to my novel to me. It works because it's three novellas. It's three, it's three <laughs> generations, and there are three novellas done together, so that's why it works. You, say, you can't do novels as well. I wish I could be hard to type what you call it stuff. But like, you can't do novels. Yeah, you know, I was curious about Ring Bird told me a few years ago when he said the God does it, and when asked about that, you became the guy that did call him about technical questions. So, is there a go to guy in the field? All the writers? So, you can call up and say, Yeah, I have this issue of like, physics. I, 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 yes, I have some people. I feel like microbiologists the way some people collect like biomass. I mean, some of the writers of the genre that calls up that. I've heard long stories from Paul Basswalk and say, I got this problem with my terrible that's or whatever. There's always like one, one or two guys in the field that turn around and fall. Yeah, that's a good question. No one in the field looks like another one. They were hoping our genre right now. No, and they shouldn't because I'm actually not trained as a scientist. I, I learn what I need to learn with 
very good story with the telemounting, which is quantum physics, or as in observing, or um, genetics, and that it does not stay that very Sometimes I'll reread something and go, so we all have we all have Dr. Mora as a researcher. So for medical stuff, I think really about Dr. Mora is that she's a doctor and a writer, and so she understands that when you ask, like, I need I need a I need a word that will slow them down for a couple chapters. <laughs> This is Dr. Mark Lincoln, who is my best friend. And I can call her up and say, Mark, I need a disease. These are the parameters. Should I need a disease. Really useful. Predator and the analogy. Yes. Yeah, that's one of the 
very reasonable but whatever that topic may be, you take it and then you humanize it. You think it's real. Yeah, I'm talking about going back and looking for your sons and 
contained in the acknowledgments. Uh, he's in the acknowledgments. Yes. I owe him a huge debt. And also, my daughter's as well, because it started, the reason why they're avoiding that sent the 2000s was because I was going to be the cool parent who left my kids with some interviews you could want and support them. And my daughter picked in sync and Backstreet Boys. And it was like, it drove me nuts. Um, so she's actually in the book as well with that. I, I remember when I started writing, I'm like, can you tell me what your life when you was a check Like, what were you? Like, do you want to marry these guys? And she's like, no, it was weirdly amorphous. Like, she wanted to just sort of. Be with them, but like it was not, it was pre sexual, but it was also heavily romantic. Like, she just imagined being with them. Well, you know, so I come from Hillbilly stock, we can get married as well. So. <laughs> My son was not quite so helpful. He was young, and I would complain about him from some black father. He would say, Make the sun go now. That's the sun that should go all black well, then if a man comes through a door with a hand. Yeah. yeah, something like that. But a little more fine. He was five billion years too early. Have you just collaborated with you? But we can technically have the story. Yeah. 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 Collaboration and then. Uh, what, the trait? <laughs> well, it was like she, she was right to a deadline. Like, like it was the, that night or the next morning or something. So I had like, a quick pass over it. Like, on the only reader, and they gave her a bunch of notes. And so like, she felt that I would incorporate myself. She needed a bit of collaboration. I thought you could substantially have a lot of stuff to do together. So, anyway, it, it, that one was a little bumpy. We were, but now we are, we've been kind of brainstorming. Like, that's a Just a brainstorm. So, I'm fascinated by how. Do it. Yes. Yeah. I am a little bit of a Yeah. 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 Yeah.